Welcome to City Scene with uh, Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and uh, Mayor Cahill, welcome. Hey, Walt, good to see you. Good to see you, and you have brought a special guest uh, with you today, Brian Ailes, who is the city's uh, finance director. Brian? Good to see you all. Good to have you back in the studio. And uh, I think today, for the benefit of our audience, we're going to be talking about uh, COVID and some of the repercussions of that and what our current situation is with COVID in the city. And we're going to be talking about the ARPA Act that Congress just passed and what its ramifications are for uh, getting some revenue back into the city here for COVID purposes. So, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, how does, how does Beverly compare uh, with, with our region and with the, with the country in general with respect to pandemic statistics, vaccination rates, positive rates, that sort of thing? Well, I'd say I mean, we're doing a lot better than most other states. Uh, Massachusetts is really at the top of the list in terms of vaccinations. So that's good. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, we're, we're tracking really closely the positive case rate. Um, and we've been creeping up over the last several weeks. We're about at the same daily incidence of positive COVID cases that we were at back at the end of March, beginning of April, which was significantly down from last winter. Um, just for some comparison, we were getting about 80 to 85 cases per 100,000. No, Beverly's not 100,000. So we're getting about 35, 40 new cases a day back last winter. Today, we're getting about 10 or 12 new cases a day. And this is based on testing, right? People, people aren't necessarily getting tested as much these days. And there are uh, asymptomatic cases that people don't know they've got. But we're at a higher rate than we were early in the summer and still at a much lower rate than we were in the, in the spike last winter. But we're tracking it very carefully and, and you know, trying to read that data and, and also track you know, whether hospitalizations start to climb up. Um, but in Massachusetts, we've been doing better, and it's not surprising than states where the vaccination rates are much lower. Yeah, I think Massachusetts, the last I heard, we were among the highest, if not the highest state, with about a 75 or 76 percent vaccination uh, percentage. And that's so. a percentage of eligible, because remember, nobody under 12 is eligible. Yeah, right, so we're looking right. at people eligible 12 and up. Right. That, that, that sounds about right on yeah, the, on the yeah. percentage. Yeah. And, and Mr. Mayor, is there anything you can tell us about the current hospitalization rate here in, in Beverly? Any statistics on that? Uh, not today. I mean, we, we, we get data from the hospital weekly, and I was on the phone earlier with the, with the hospital president trying to get an update. Uh, we haven't seen a big spike um, in Beverly. Um, but, you know, those numbers are going up on whole around the country. So it's really about breaking it down and looking at our own locality and region and state. Um, and so, we, as I said, we're, you know, we're, we haven't had an alarm bell rung on that yet, and yeah. hopefully we won't. Yeah. Now, we're, uh, the BevCam studio, as our, as our viewers know, is located in the high school. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, that was a touch-and-go situation up until almost just a, a week or two ago. And uh, the, uh, the city or the CDC uh, and, and the state advised uh, students, high schools, all, all public high schools, to come in wearing masks. But that's only effective until October 1st, I believe. So what, what happens there? Each school district makes so, its own determination. Right. And so by, by touch and go, you meant whether or not people would have be to masked. Wear masks I mean, or not. Yeah, the, I think everybody's expectation, goal and expectation, is that this school year be a a regular school year in terms of full days right. on campus, in person. Um, and we don't want anything less than that for our kids. And because of that, uh, because of the Delta variant, the concerns that we may be seeing an upswing here, um, because of that, the State um, Department of Education, working with the Department of Public Health at the state level, they came out with an order, okay, to start the school year, everybody's got to mask up within, in the buildings at all times. Now, you can take mass breaks outdoors when you're, doing, when you're outdoors for lunch or outdoor classes. And we've, our school district's done a lot of work to set up outdoor learning spaces. Um, you don't need to wear the mask when you're outdoors. You ask what happens after October 1st. What the state put in place is, a, you know, a, the, the school committees at the local level can reevaluate if a given school building has 80% or more compliance, or should I say 80% or more of all the personnel the students and the adults working in the schools, 
if 80 percent or more are vaccinated, mm -hmm. then then a local school committee can reevaluate mm -hmm. and, and maybe get rid of that requirement for vaccinated individuals. Unvaccinated at that point would still need to wear masks indoors. You know, we're not there in terms of those percentages. The vaccination numbers on the whole are strong in Massachusetts and on the whole are strong in Beverly. Our lowest rates among our pop subpopulations, 16 to 19 year olds are only somewhere in the mid, mid to high 50s on vaccination percentages. And the 20 to 29 year olds, young adults, are among adults, they're the lowest um, vaccinated group. But, and then of course our kids under 12 can't yet get a vaccine. Right, yeah, yeah. So I don't know that people should expect a change that quickly after October 1st, it, it may be that masks are the norm in the schools throughout the fall. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that depends on vaccination rates locally. And it also depends on um, what happens with the Delta variant. Right. Does it spike up? Does it run its course and, and, and not cause problems so much in our region as it has in other parts of the country? And then is there another variant coming behind it to worry yeah. about or not? Yeah. You know, we'll, we need to manage our way through this, through this fall and winter and into the spring. And, you know, hopefully, as I said, everyone's goal is that the kids be in school full days, full classes, and they get the best yeah, they can out of this the, year. That's the best possible yeah, outcome. Uh, now let's let's talk. You know, the federal government has been doing a lot in response to the to the COVID pandemic, and one of the things they did recently was they passed the so-called ARPA Act. And I'm going to turn over to you, Brian. Now, what exactly is the ARPA Act? It's the American Rescue Plan Act. What exactly is that, and and how does that affect some a city like 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 Beverly, Brian? Sure. So, um, if I could just back up just a hair sure. um, in the timeline. Um, prior to the ARPA Act being enacted uh, earlier this calendar year, uh, last fiscal or last calendar year during the pandemic, uh, the city had access to what was what was referred to as CARES funds, um, and that was uh, uh, about 3.7 million dollars to uh, combat the pandemic over the last 18 months, um, addressing health risks, um, testing. Uh, uh, we did uh, some staffing adjustments to uh, contract tracing and things of that nature. Um, and so that money is set to expire this December. Uh, and then that, that pool of money will go away. And what we're looking to uh, take advantage of now is this ARPA funding, which ARPA is coming funding, our way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that gives us about a three-year window uh, of eligibility to, to spend these funds. Mm -hmm. uh, in total... It's uh, $12.6 million will be coming to Beverly mm -hmm. um, in s various allotments. Uh, and the way the allotments work, um, about 4.4, 4 .4, I'm sorry, of that 12.6 uh, comes because we're Beverly and because of our population. Uh, and every city and town across Massachusetts will receive a proportionate a share proportion, similar. Oh, based on population alone. Correct. Okay. And then in addition to that, um, every county is allotted uh, a certain amount of money from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And because we're in Essex County and effectively the county government uh, doesn't really exist, um, it gets reallocated out to the communities within that county. And so that will provide an additional $8.2 million uh, to the city uh, to use. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying, the CARES Act, which was the initial, what, $3.7 million you mentioned? Correct. So have we spent all that or have we gotten all of that yet? Uh, There's that? A, a little bit more than a half a million dollars left of that, which will carry us through the end of the calendar Okay. Year. And the ARPA money, have we started receiving ARPA money yet, or we're, we'll get that after we get, use up all the CARES money? What's the situation with Yeah, that? so we've applied uh, for the funding, and as a result of the application, um, the state has allocated us 50% of, uh, of the money. So right now we have in a bank account 50% of that money. Mm -hmm. um, our charter and our uh, local ordinances require us to go before the city council before we can spend any of that money. So we currently have, the mayor has uh, requested that the council review and approve uh, the ability for us to spend those funds in accordance with the grant. All right. So the ARPA, ARPA money, we're not, we're not working directly with the feds. We're working, that's allocated through the states, and you're working with the state to get your ARPA money. Is that, is that correct? I'll jump in. Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> so the, the, the CARES money, as Brian said, we have a little over half a million left. We've got to spend it by the end of this calendar year. We don't want to turn it back to the federal government. It's been allocated to us, so we're working to try to ensure that it gets spent effectively. 
um, on the right things and, and in a way that, that they'll ultimately approve its expenditure rate. Um, the ARPA money, as Brian said, half of the 12.6 is in our accounts. The other half will come in the next several months. Um, and what was the question? Well, uh, working <laughs> with the state. Yeah. So U.S. Treasury has issued guidelines for what's allowable and eligible expenditures. And they've done that in, in a, they've had to interpret and read the legislative intent of Congress. So, you know, they, they've given guidance and we're looking at those broad categories of eligible expenditures now. Um, and we want to make sure that at the end of the day, what, what we ultimately, with a lot of community input and a lot of, a lot of dialogue and really an ongoing conversation, because we'll be spending this money over three plus years, um, that we spend it in ways that after the fact, the U.S. Treasury won't say, sorry, that's not a way we're going to approve. Because then we would have to make well, up that money. To, you'd have to send it back money? Or? Well, we'd have to give them money back, and then we'd have to find another stream for, yeah. So well, you know what I'm saying. So, yeah. so, for example, last year we worked, with, we worked with the state. The state had much more direct involvement with the CARES money than they are with the ARPA money. The state pre-approved us to spend, I think we spent over $600,000 on improving the HVAC systems at two of our elementary schools in preparation for the kids to be in the schools this mm -hmm. past year. So that was to improve air handling and air, air transfer. Um, and so we got that pre-approval. They're not doing pre-approvals with the ARPA funds. So we need to be very thorough and attentive and, and thoughtful about how we expend this money mm -hmm. so it doesn't come back. You know, and, and later, at some point in the future, we made a big expenditure and we're told yeah. that really wasn't the right way to do it. Okay. Well, Brian, you said that, that we already have a certain amount of money in our bank account, but do we have to, that's not ours yet, we have to, we have to file some sort of an application to, to actually use that money, to draw that money out? How will that work? So we filed the application and been approved for the f federal government to give us those funds. So mm -hmm. they've given them to us. Okay. The, the, the approval process that I referred to was more an, uh, within our city. Uh, the mayor, any time we receive any type of grant, the mayor has to request that the city council approve the expenditure of that grant. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's by statute. Okay. And have, they, have you had a meeting yet to, to, to get that approval so, or is that coming up? Right. So we, we presented to them last month. But understandably, I wouldn't have expected them to, to just turn around and vote it. Um, so we asked them, we, we asked them, if possible, to try to be ready to vote on it by their September 28th meeting, um, knowing that we're having a public meeting next week um, where we're inviting the public to, to share thoughts and concerns and ideas about how that money should be expended. We've also met with counselors. We've met with most of the counselors. We have a couple more to go to talk through some initial thoughts about where we see priori priorities, you know, um, for, it, for expending the money and get their input and their thoughts as, you know, we're, they and I are all elected to represent, you know, everybody in the city, right? So, uh, and we're working with, um, with some of the stakeholders who we know are, you know, are close to some of the needs. So, you know, Brian can go through the categories in a minute, but we know that our local affordable housing and, 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 and uh, social service Nonprofits. We know that our local chamber and Main Streets, they're working with, be they individuals, families, uh, neighborhoods, or be they local businesses. We know that they're close to the issues that, that have been that right. people have been struggling with as well. Sure, sure. So we're trying to work that conversation. And the last thing I'll say is, next Tuesday evening, September 14th, we're going to have a public meeting from 7 to 9 p.m. And we're inviting anybody who, who has a thought to, to really join in and mm -hmm. share those thoughts. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting here. It's, it's September 8th right now. It's a Wednesday. Correct. And this is next Tuesday, six mm -hmm. days from now. And now where will that meeting be held? It'll be remote. It'll be a Zoom oh, virtual be a meeting. Zoom meeting. Okay, yep. so people can weigh in on. Mm -hmm. and, and you're inviting anybody, all the public? Or you, you'll publish the Zoom URL yep. for, for that? Yep. And anybody in the and, public. And, and if two hours isn't enough time, and it may well not be, you know, we'll just we'll we'll provide other ways for people to follow yeah. up with, you know, be it email or phone call. Yeah. Or, um, and, and and really, this money will be spent over three plus years, not in the next couple of months. Yeah. Yeah. There are some expenditures that may come quickly because you know we've been looking for several, you know, really for several months now, uh, and tracking the needs and and some of the things we think make sense to try to do 
to help address those needs. Yeah. So now you mentioned that there are, were certain uh, approved, if I can use that word, ways to spend this money. Mm -hmm. And Brian, can, can you give us an idea of what those, those specific approved ways are that we spend the money so that the feds <laughs> don't want it back? Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's kind of four very broad categories. And we can, we can talk about each one individually if you'd mm -hmm. like or, or however you want to handle it, Walt. Um, the, the, the first piece that they identify is that they understand local governments, they being the Treasury and the federal government, the legislation, they understand that local governments have also felt the economic impact right. of the pandemic. We have a lot of flexible revenue streams that have fluctuated over the last 18 months, and as a result, we haven't taken in as much revenue as we would typically expect in a given year. Thus, we're not able to spend as much on general government services mm -hmm. as we would in a typical year. So recognizing that, they've allowed municipalities to identify through a formula what your quote-unquote lost revenue is. And once you identify that figure, you're then able to uh, expense certain general government costs directly to the grant, which don't fall into any other type of category mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a general catch-all so so let me so if uh, restaurants weren't open let's say right so a lot of meals weren't eaten and a lot of taxes weren't paid on those meals right so is this the kind of thing that you can say gee we didn't get x amount of dollars for because normally in the, during a summer however the period is we'd have this many meals eaten at so many restaurants and we've gotten this amount of tax revenue is yeah. that sort of what you hit the nail right on the head that's yeah. a that's a key area that we saw a decline in yeah. uh, another uh, big area for in, instance you may not think about this but um, the uh, revenue down at Lynch Park for instance mm -hmm. the parking revenue uh, mm -hmm. because we uh, limited certain access at certain times in the year we didn't generate as much revenue well, that mm -hmm. revenue in turn goes back into the park to keep right. the park up. Um, okay. And so we're able to kind of backfill some of that and uh, charge certain expenditures to, to the grant. Yeah. We've identified roughly about, we think it's going to be in the range of about $2 million based on the formula over the three-year period okay. that we'll be able to backfill of this, of this $12.6 million. Okay. And I know another one of the, the, the four that, that uh, you are going to talk about, maybe you can talk about supporting the pu public health response because there's been more pressure put on your, the public health system than no normally would, more costs, more assets, more. So tell us about that. So I, uh, please jump in, Mayor, at, at, at any point. But this is an area that still there's unknowns. Yeah. Um, we know that this funding needs to last us three years. We don't know what the landscape looks like a year from now, never mind a month from now. Um, so we need to be prepared to allocate resources um, quickly um, if we see certain spikes in uh, certain types of variants or we need to roll out different types of uh, testing clinics or um, you know, different types of health responses that we've had to do over the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are kind of, this kind of tranche of spending is designed to address the specific health emergency. Right. Um, so these are things that the health department wouldn't normally be doing in a normal year when, the, when COVID wasn't prevalent, but because COVID is here, you've got to do these things and run these tests or hire these people or buy this equipment. And that's where that piece would come in, is that? Yeah. And, yeah. and we do know that there are some staffing needs throughout some of our uh, direct health facing departments that we're going to need to address with some of this money because the, the typical annual budget doesn't have the capacity necessarily to do that. Um, so this is a way we can uh, maybe staff up in the health department in some areas to provide additional services um, that can help the public remain safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, one, one thing that the, that the pandemic has really you know, lay, lain bare in, in a really hard way for so many people is that there are real inequities in, in, in public health or real inequities in health care. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of people who are Look, the people who are most at risk on their health are the same people who are most at risk for their housing, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a yeah, socioeconomic sure, dynamic, and, yeah. and people who are closer to the edge, um, you know, economically, you know, th that, that's a real challenge on both of those fronts. So on the health side, one thing that we've all been learning is that the way public health departments have been structured and staffed in city after city, town after town, that's not going to work going forward. It's not just the pandemic. The pandemic has really piled everything on to those departments. You know, we're, we're not 
unusual in that we have a health director, one full-time public health nurse, and two health inspectors. Okay? Yeah. And so we've staffed up, we've added, we've added several part-time public health, temporary public health nurse positions, and we're looking at, you know, and, and we've also increased the, the health inspector by, by half a position. Maybe we're going to go to a full position. Um, because, yeah, the health department's had to do some things this past year they've never had to do. Uh, and yet, public health, you know, our local hospital system, our local community health center, which is located in Salem, our social service agencies, they're all part of that safety net. And our health department needs to be able to do more within that within that network going forward. So we'll be really looking carefully at how to restructure. Some of this may, some of this will be temporary, right? Some of the money we spend may be for positions that are temporary, right. offering programs that are temporary. But I think we'll find as we go that some of what we begin to work on, begin to invest more in, may well show itself to be a long-term or a permanent need. Yeah. So that's, that's where we, we want to yeah. be thoughtful about how we, start to expend the, the grant money, recognizing that some of it will, you know, some of that work will cease when the grant ends, right. but other parts of that work may need to be funded going forward. Yeah, and there may be some things that we're not anticipating now or are even thinking Absolutely. about that could crop up tomorrow or next week or next year mm -hmm. that, that you're not, that you have to be ready for. Yeah. I, I'd just add to that, Mayor, uh, in addition to, you know, it may being a permanent or, a, uh, or, or not permanent, we may feel that we can do some of the work internally within the city government. We also know that there's going to be aspects of this that we need to partner um, with community partners to get done. Um, and that's why the input from the, from the community is so important through this. And, and yeah. Yes, and, and other grants can help as well in the longer term. You know, we just, we just this year, just in the last couple of months, secured additional state funding with a, in a partnership with several communities. We were sharing one mental health counselor amongst several police departments. We just were able to get a second full-time mental health counselor with an increase in the grant. So now Beverly is going to have essentially one of those full-time and the other will be shared amongst another three communities. So yeah. that's increasing that capacity at a time when, again, with all the struggles and stresses that people have been facing, it's very much needed. Yeah. So, Brian, what, what else? Now, we talked about a couple. What, what, other, what other categories of uses, like uh, negative economic and health impacts, city infrastructure improvements? Uh, talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, both of those um, are acceptable categories under the 150-page under the, uh, guidance that the Treasury uh, issued. Uh, the mayor kind of alluded uh, a little bit to some of the negative, negative economic and health impacts that we know we may be able to address um, through this funding. Um, some of those, uh, the allowability standards, uh, require us to look at our census tracts within the city. Um, some may be eligible, some may be not. That's, uh, that's an area that we really need to um, look at very closely before we uh, go spending a lot of money in, in a particular initiative. Um, but we, we're, we're open to suggestions. That's why we're having these public meetings. That's why we're speaking with counselors uh, to try to get as much input as we can before we, uh, before we start down any one path. Here are two thoughts to share with you, Walt. One, Bryant mentioned the census tracts. There are about 45 census tracts around the state that are eligible for extra attention with this money. We have one in Beverly. It's essentially between Rantoul Street and the Bass River down through Gloucester Crossing. And it, it, it's focused on... On, um, on financial need, on the challenges that, that the residents in, in this part of town face particularly, and, and the, again, the stressors of the pandemic. So we're looking carefully at, at how to better serve that neighborhood. And one of the things we are looking at that, that is both programmatic and infrastructure is the fact that the teen center on McPherson Drive, the McPherson Teen right. Center, mm -hmm. really needs support. And so that's an area that we're, we're looking at carefully for some, you know, some uh, capital upgrades, and also to make sure that there's enough offered for the, for the young people down there. Yeah. Um, so that that's one. And then the other one is, as we're looking at our 12.6 million and, and having this, you know, we've had a, a really wide-ranging kind of freewheeling set of conversations amongst all our department heads, with counselors now, and, and started to work with member of the community groups, and all that together. We also have to pay close attention to what the state is doing 
because the state has its own resources and it also has a good amount of its own ARPA funding that the state is, re is, is required and empowered to spend. So as a small city, we want to look at what the state is providing on the housing front, on the public health front, to make sure that we don't start to push money in a direction that yeah. it, it, it may be best for the state to, to, to help fund. So it, it's, a, it's really yeah. feeling our way with them and communicating with the state as we go uh, to make sure that, that we try to get that, you know, that, that best outcome with, it sounds like a lot of money, that, that we're working with locally, but it, it can be spent quickly yeah, with a <laughs> lot of really worthy efforts. And maybe to go back to the infrastructure piece beyond, beyond the teen center question, um, you know, we know that we have an older housing stock that's all through the downtown and within that, within that census tract area because we know that thousands of units of housing were built in Beverly when the shoe went up in the early 1900s. And a lot of that is multifamily wood-framed housing that needs all kinds of, of energy retrofits for, you know, to guard against the extremes of climate, the, the, the cold snaps in the winter and the heat waves, yeah. and, and will improve public health for, the, for those neighbors and also can save them money with energy efficiency. Yeah. So, you know, we're looking at that and, and trying to figure out whether that's an area that is, is clearly comfortably eligible and what we might accomplish if we try to invest within that yeah. area, for example. Yeah. Yeah, how this is all kind of intertwined, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now, Brian, uh, do we have a certain fixed amount of time in which to spend this ARPA money? Yes. And, um, and what is that time? So right? the the term that the the federal government uses, costs need to be incurred, uh, and that's by the end of December 2024. So we've got a little more than three years uh, okay. before that money will. Cease okay. to be available. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, so we, we've just got about a minute left. Uh, Mayor Mike, can you uh, can you repeat again when this public hearing uh, will mm -hmm. be for our, for our viewers? Uh, yeah. This is so next Tuesday evening, yeah. September fourteenth, right, seven to nine p.m. In a, in a Zoom, and we'll and be pushing be that out there. And and that's not the only opportunity by any by any means. Yeah. You know, we're we're looking for the council to take this up at their September twenty eighth meeting, and given that we're going to be spending this money over the next three plus years, it's really an ongoing conversation once we've all joined in it. Yeah, very good. Well, we're, we're, we're just about out of time, and I'm, I'd like to uh, thank my guests today, Mayor Mike Cahill, as always, Thanks, and the Mom. city's finance director, Brian Ailes. Brian, good to see you again. Yes, thank you. And I'd like to remind our viewers that uh, you've been watching City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.